Thank you, Ira, for the introduction. So you have heard about all the possible etiologies of osteonecrosis of the femoral head, and there is a vast uh, variety of them, making it uh, difficult to understand. Unfortunately, with the treatment options, it's no better. There are many uh, operative and non-operative options that have been reported in literature. And the aim of the current talk is to, to give you an overview on these treatment options and the results in literature. When you search for treatment of osteonecrosis of the femoral head in PubMed, you get over 5,000 hits. So you need good review literature to give you an idea what's out there um, in the reports. And my presentation is based on these two reviews. It's from uh, the editor Ko from South Korea and Michael Mont, both experts on the field of osteonecrosis. It's a book from 2014. And this one is a very recent review article from last year, end of last year, uh, reporting the evidence for the treatment of AVN. I can strongly recommend this. And most of what's in my presentation is from these two reports. When comparing the efficacy of treatments, then you have to know about the natural history of the pathology. And it's stated for the osteonecrosis of the femoral, femoral head that once clinical and radiographic evidence of osteonecrosis occurs, progression to collapse and arthritis occur if no un intervention is undertaken. So when you have a symptomatic hip, and when you have radiographic evidence on conventional imaging, a collapse occurs within two years in 32 to 79 percent of all the hips. And the predictors for progression are the size and the location of the lesion and the radiographic stage. One method to quantify the size of the lesion is this carbol angle first described on the conventional images. And now there's also the modified Kerbal angle for the MRI. It's measured on the mid-sagittal and mid-coronal plane with the angle, and it, it's added up. And they could find that it's pro, uh, prognostic for the, for the risk of future collapse. So the, if the combined angle is less than 190 degrees, all hips survived. If the angle is uh, between 190 degrees and 240 degrees, about 50% of the hips showed collapse after two to three years. And those with an angle exceeding 240 degrees all eventually collapsed. There are uh, a few staging systems known. The, the one mostly used in the Western countries is the ARCO classification. The other ones are very similar, but the stages differ. This one is uh, to illustrate the ARCO classification. It starts with a zero, which is a normal hip with no signs of AVN uh, on the X-ray or the MRI. Then it goes to stage one, where the, you can find a normal X-ray and only signs in the CT or the MRI. Stage two has changes in the x-ray with osteolysis and sclerosis. Then there is a stage three, uh, early and late stage three, with the, the famous crescent sign, the subchondral bone that uh, is fractured underneath the cartilage layer. And the collapse is the late stage three, and four is the one with osteoarthritis. The other sim uh, systems are very similar, but they differ in terms of the stages. Very important for the treatment is whether it's pre-collapse or post-collapse. For the ARCO classification, it's between uh, stage 3A and 3B. As we heard in the previous talks, bilateral involvement is very often, about 80%. So when you make diagnosis for, for one side, you often see that the other side also is also affected. And Mont, in a review, described the natural history for asymptomatic hips, and it's very impressive. Even in asymptomatic hips, 60% develop symptoms within three years, and about 50% show a collapse within four years. 
And again, the predictors for progression are size, location, and also the radiographic stage. He concluded that the only lesion which can be observed and doesn't need any treatment are small medially located lesions which show a benign course and only progression in less 10%. And all others, whether they are symptomatic or not, sh uh, should need some action. Treatments are split into those uh, with uh, surgical treatment and the non-operative treatments. They include medications, bisphosphonates, statins, anticoagulation. There are some reports about hyperbaric oxygen therapy or extracorporeal shockwave therapy, but the, the evidence for those is very little and the results are uncertain and the indication is only for very early stages. I, I'm going to focus on the operative treatments. They can be split in cortic compression, femoral osteotomies, bone grafting, cell-based treatments, and also arthroplasty. The most commonly performed procedure in the Western world is cortic compression. It's indicated in the early stages, certainly pre-collapse. In the Asian countries where a vascular necrosis is very frequent, uh, it's, it's rarely performed. They prefer femoral osteotomies, as we're going to, uh, to see. It's uh, thought that the inflammation and the necrosis leads to increased osseous pressure and the decompression through a lateral drill hole, either by a trefine or multiple drilling, releases this pressure and it could be shown that they have good results regarding the pain, but it's the, the, pre uh, the prevention effect is very questionable in the literature. So this is a summary also from Michael Mons review. He showed the survival of the joint in 80 to 100 percent, but that's for stage one, so no signs on the radiograph. And there is a wide range from 25 to 100 percent for stage two. So limited evidence regarding preservation of the joint. Next group are the femoral osteotomies. They can be split in two groups, the angular osteotomies, as we just have seen during the live surgery this morning, and then the rotational osteotomies. The idea of a femoral, proximal femoral osteotomy is to turn the necrotic zone out of the weight-bearing area, either by, a, by an angle or by rotating it anterior or posterior. The indications here are uh, more advanced stages, pre-collapse or early collapse stages. First to the angular intertrochanteric osteotomy. We have seen a case today. It usually uh, includes some varus uh, osteotomy to turn the necrotic zone, as we have heard mostly in the anterior superior area, medially out of the weight-bearing zone, but you can add also flexion or extension to turn it an more anterior or posterior. Potential problems are shortening of the leg length, a high riding trochanter. There has been a discussion about uh, uh, trochanteric advancement and pseudotrosis in older patients, such as the one we have just recently seen. The results actually are quite good. Uh, for advanced stages, stage two and stage three, they show a survivorship from 80 to almost 100% after six to 18 years. The next field is uh, the one for the rotational osteotomies, and I'm going, uh, uh, not, I'm, I won't go into details, it's uh, the topic of, Dr. Um, of the next talk, and I'm very curious to see those results, I have to say. Sugioka first described this, te this technique. There is uh, a description for an anterior rotation and a posterior rotation uh, around the femoral head neck axis. It's certainly technical challenging and uh, there is an iatrogenic risk of uh, uh, the lesion of the neutron vessel for the femoral head. Again, the results here are quite good for advanced stages two and three, 80 to 100% at the long-term follow-up. Bone grafting can be split into non-vascularized bone grafting and vascularized bone grafting. First, the technique to access the, the femoral head. We have seen uh, this morning the trapdoor. You get direct access to the head, direct access to the necrotic zone. You can control the debridement. There are other 
uh, techniques described, the light bulb technique, where you open a window at a head-neck junction and you co uh, come in a retrograde way to the necrotic zone. You certainly need fluoroscopy to control uh, the the debridement, the, the or there are uh, techniques over the uh, cortic compression tunnel from the lateral side of the femur. They can also be used for bone grafting. The idea is to uh, give mechanical support and biological augmentation. It's indicated in the early stages. Um, Non-vascularized bone grafting can be uh, split into impaction bone grafting, either autologous or allograft, as we, seen, as we have seen this morning. Cortical strut grafts, there's also a description, or osteochondral autografts. That also, that's also a case from ours where we have corrected uh, the offset deformity at the anterosuperior head neck junction, and this bone from the head neck junction was put into the necrotic lesion. There's a wide range of, uh, for the results, for the survivorship, for non-vascularized bone grafting from 20 to about 90 uh, percent at two to nine years. Now, the vascularized bone grafts indications are more advanced stages, pre-collapse or early collapse. There are description for the free fibula graft, where the, the fibula graft is put into the cortic compression um, tunnel and the perineal uh, vessels are anastomosed to the uh, lateral circumflex femoral artery. Another possibility is a pedicled bone graft from the iliac crest, from the deep circumflex iliac artery. This is not a free, this is a pedicled uh, uh, bone graft and there are uh, certain techniques for muscle pedicle grafting. It's a piece of bone where the mus muscular vascular uh, structures are used to uh, perform, uh, to perfuse the bone. So it can be either from the tensor muscle, the sartorius, the gluteus medius or the quadratus, depending where the lesion is. Also uh, quite a big range of uh, survivorship after also long-term follow-up. Then there, these techniques can be combined. Our standard here, as you could see this morning, is the approach is the surgical hip dislocation with the, with the trapdoor. We have direct uh, uh, visibility on the necrotic zone, and we usually combine it with some angular femoral osteotomy, as you could see. It gives the advantage that you also can address the concomitant osseous deformities, which are very frequent, what, us, what Morris told us, in up to 97%, so you can correct these impingement uh, deformities. This is a new technique, cell-based treatments. It's bone marrow injection or injection from the peripheral blood, and young Cho Kim is going to talk about, so he will tell you about the results. And finally, arthroplasty, of course, when arthritis is present, this is the indication for stage four or late stage three. Historically, they had a high failure rate for patients with osteonecrosis of the femoral head but it improved uh, uh, with the modern arthroplasty techniques. The results are the same as in the patients at the same age without osteonecrosis. Mont also found some risk factors. They, they found inferior results in patients with sickle cell disease or renal transplant and a, a survivorship at six years from about 97%. But please bear in mind, these are all very young patients mainly between 30 and 50 years. They're, all, they're mainly male patients, and th those patients, younger than 50 and male, they show the, the worst results of the total hip arthroplasty in the registries. So after 15 to 16 years, one of three had a revision, whereas the older patients, there is only one out of 20. So despite the, the improvement, uh, total hip arthroplasty has its limitations in these young patients. So in conclusion, osteonecrosis of the femoral head is a progressive uh, pathology, also in the asymptomatic hip. There is a great variety of treatment options and it's difficult to compare them because of the negative predictors with, which differ among these patient series. The outcome for, of non-operative treatment options remain uncertain. Core 
decompressions provide good symptom relief but may not prevent collapse. And femoral osteotomies, bone grafting or a combination have uh, promising results also in advanced stages. Thank you.